Amen. In Hebrews 9, I want to look at verse 15 where it says, And for this cause he, that's Jesus, is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Uh, I didn't particularly think of last week as being a part one to anything, but last week we were talking about consider Jesus and looking at Jesus and some of the things that Hebrews is telling us about this Jesus. And, and here we come and it says, and for this cause, on account of this very things we were talking about last week, on account of Jesus' amazing singularity, he is the mediator of the New Testament. He is the mediator of this new covenant. This new covenant, which is so important and so precious and so easily overlooked. I mean, we all know the term new covenant, but do we actually, do we actually each day rejoice that we have a new covenant? That we are the possessors, and it's interesting, there's a couple of different words in Greek for new, as there are, it seems, for most things, and, and one of them would mean new in, new in chronological order, as in most recent but the, the other one describes new in the sense of fresh. It doesn't have to necessarily be the most recent, although oftentimes what's freshest will be most recent, but it's the one which is, has got a freshness to it. And that's the word which describes the new covenant. It's, a, it's not just new because it's more recent, it's fresher. It's got an aliveness to it. It's a precious covenant. It's a great and special covenant. Is that good news? Jesus delivers to us this new covenant that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant, the redemption, the, the full ransom of those transgressions which were under that first covenant, when we transgressed against that covenant, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. God calls out to us that we might come and receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Not just an inheritance, not a corruptible inheritance, not an inheritance that can be stolen, not an inheritance which can be eaten away, but an inheritance which is eternal. A permanent, blessed, powerful inheritance. Is that something to be desired? When He calls us, when He calls us to Himself, when He woos us by the Spirit, when He draws us in, He's drawing us to an eternal inheritance. His desire is that we would receive this inter eternal inheritance. That's, a, that's an interesting thing to desire, isn't it? Now, we, we begin at verse 15 with the and for this cause. And so, let, let's back up and look at verse 14 for a moment, and then we'll back up a little further and take a longer view. But he says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The closing phrasing in verse 14 is so powerful. He's talking about the past is done. The door is closed. You can have a conscience which is purged from dead works and now be alive to serve the living God. He, he closes the door to the past and opens the door to a great new future. This is a great thing. This is the reason he's the mediator. For this cause, he's the mediator of this new covenant. Is that good news? Yeah. Now, let's uh, back up as far as verse 8 for a moment, where it says, The Holy Ghost this signifying. Now, let's understand where we, we've been. Actually, this all begins in chapter 8, but we're not going to go quite that far. But in chapter 8, he's comparing the covenants and talking about the, the, the change here, and we'll look at a little bit of that in a moment. And then in chapter 9, he's describing the, the tabernacle and the ministry in the tabernacle and Aaron's priesthood and the way everything was set up. But he says at verse 8, the Holy Ghost this signifying. In other words, the Holy Spirit ends up being both the author and the interpreter of the Levitical system. The entire 
tabernacle system is brought into being by the Holy Spirit, but he also is going to tell us what it represents. This is commentary. This is a footnote. The Holy Ghost is telling us what this is all about. Have you ever seen, perhaps in the back of a Bible or in some sort of Bible dictionary or Bible encyclopedia of some sort, some illustration of the tabernacle and all this elaborate stuff going on? One of these large dioramas, they have these big models of it, you know, that sit on a, a table and they're, they're the size of a bedroom. And, and they're there and they got all these little guys running around and little stuff and all the furnishings and all this. Three of us, okay, the rest of us. I don't know what you're talking about. But I've actually been to the Bible Museum in uh, Amsterdam, which is uh, when you see a photograph of one of these little dioramas in some one of these books, frequently if you look at the thing, it'll say it's from the Bible Museum in Amsterdam. They have some of the most amazing things there. You should go sometime. But uh, little scale model guys, high priests wearing all the garments, all the stuff. And you look at that and you think to yourself, what in the world is all this about? Here's the answer. He says, the Holy Ghost thus signifying. This is what it's all about. This is what it's about. You've got your idea, I've got mine, scholars have theirs, but this is what the Holy Ghost says about the, that. The, the Holy Ghost this signifying, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. The whole structure of the thing was designed to say, since you can't go here, you understand that the process is incomplete. There is this holiest place that you can't go. Not even the priests can go in there. Nobody gets to go in there but one person and him only once a year. Under very special circumstances. But we've read Genesis God designed the earth so that he could come and walk with man. We've read the last chapter of Revelation. That's what he's working back towards. His plan isn't to find a way to have good distance between us. I got my bedroom, you got yours, don't you mess with my stuff. He wanted to be with us. That's always been his desire. The tabernacle doesn't illustrate how he can be with us. It illustrates that there's something that separates us. And something that keeps us from being with him. We're more with him than we were when we were completely on our own. But we're not as with him as we should be if being with him is what it's all about. That's what the Holy Spirit says the whole thing pictures. Is that the process is incomplete as long as this tabernacle stands. Now, when is that process complete? Well, you know, the Gospels record for us. As Jesus is hanging on the cross, as he gives up the ghost, the veil is ripped from the top to the bottom. The veil that separated that innermost sanctum and said, you can't come in here, is ripped. Yes. Now, walk through this with me for a moment, because this is a kind of a, a, a microcosm that illustrates the way that we tend to do things on our own. What did Israel do about the veil being ripped? Was there rejoicing in the streets? Ticker tape parades? Did everyone dance and sing? The veil has been ripped from the top to the bottom. And this is, when we say from the top, you know, we're not talking about from there. Nobody could get to the top. And this veil, it isn't some piece of fabric that you might just grab and rip with your hands. They estimate it was at least four inches thick. It's this amazing woven thing that's just, it's phenomenal. And it's ripped from the top to the bottom. Now, who could rip a, a 40 foot, 4 inch thick curtain from the top to the bottom? Well, not you, not me, not anybody in the WWF. <laughs> who could do this thing? And the answer is God. It's, if God hadn't done this, none of us could have managed it. But but what happens? Is there a parade? Is there a celebration? Is there rejoicing? Does everybody decide, hallelujah, the veil has been ripped. We're all allowed into the holy place. No, they, they repair the veil and go right back to what they were doing, don't they? Start over with the same old, same old. Because that's what people do. That's what religion is like. That's what Folks left on their own build for themselves. We can fix this. No, you can't. That's the problem. And your efforts to fix it only, you know, it wasn't very long later 
that the Romans encircled Jerusalem and tore down, burned down, destroyed the temple. And from that day to this, we're rolling up on almost 1950 years, there has been no Levitical system. Because when man tries to put it back together, man can't keep it together. The Levitical system is over when the temple, when the veil is ripped from the top to the bottom. And that veil is what we're talking about here. The veil that separated. He said, the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. Now, they knew where it was physically. They knew technically how to get in there. I mean, you'd say, how would I get in? Well, you go that way. I mean, it, wasn't, it wasn't that they had no concept of how to find this place, but they were not allowed in. And it wasn't just a matter of a rule. The people who went in inappropriately dropped dead. That suggests to you that you're not going to do that. As long as the first tabernacle was standing, there was no way for us to go in to that holy place. Now he says at verse 9, which was a figure for the time then present. And the word that we're translating figure is actually the word for parable. And what it literally means is something laid alongside of something else. It's describing uh, an analogy something that you put beside something else which isn't that thing but helps us to see and understand that thing which is for some reason difficult for us to understand. A parable is a thing thrown beside something else to help us understand the complicated thing. And what he's saying is that the tabernacle itself was an analogy for something. It's not an end, it's a picture. It's an illustration. It's a sermon. It's supposed to point us towards something. We're not supposed to worship it and decide that we're cool because that's we've got it. We're supposed to understand what it is trying to tell us. It is illustrating something. It is illustrating that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. It is illustrating that we serve a God who wants to be in fellowship with us and is willing to come to us to make that happen. It illustrates that there is to be prayer in our fellowship and association, that there is to be giving involved in our fellowship and association. Is this coming through? And there's a whole list of things that it illustrates, all of which describe God and his relationship to us. It's a giant illustration, and it's an illustration of not only the need for Christ, but how Christ answers that need. And what will be available when he does, it's all pictured right there. And the scripture says, that's what the Holy Ghost was trying to show us with this analogy that he laid out for us. It was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Now the word perfect, as we're going to encounter it throughout this morning, we're dealing with a word which means complete. It means complete or finished. And the point is, nobody could be completed or finished in regards to their conscience by the Levitical system. You could be improved, but you couldn't be completed or finished as regards your conscience by the Levitical system. Are, are you getting that? We're going to, in a, in a bit, we're going to see this used in reference to sin. And when you become perfect in relationship to sin, it doesn't mean that you're sinless because there isn't any such person other than Jesus. So how do we become perfect? We are completed or finished in relationship to sin. Or... Uh, Kenneth West describes the effect of the word this way, that which needs nothing to be what it should be. Complete or finished. That which needs nothing to be what it should be. 
when we, we're growing toward a perfect man, that which needs nothing to be that which it should be. Are you still here? So, uh, having read verse 9, let's go back to chapter 8 for a moment, and then we'll come back and press forward again. In chapter 8, he says at verse 6, But now hath he, that's Jesus, obtained a more excellent ministry. More excellent than who? Well, in the previous verse, we mentioned Moses. And in the previous chapters, we've been comparing him to everybody and everything. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry. Up to this point, the comparison has been on a personal basis between the person of Jesus and all these other personages. And he says, but Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry. He's obtained a more, and and the word excellent is talking about surpassing here. His ministry is more surpassing. It just goes way beyond what everybody else has did. By how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Having been comparing the person of Jesus with all these other personages, now he begins to compare the author of Hebrews by the Spirit to compare the covenant of Jesus with these other covenants. The notion being that the better workman is going to produce the better product. And if you're going to pick a covenant, pick the one mediated by Jesus who has a more excellent ministry. Because he's the better mediator, he will therefore mediate a better covenant. Is that coming through? Now what do we mean by a better covenant? Well, this is again an interesting statement. We have a lot of different ideas of what better might mean. But the word that we translate better more literally means stronger. It's the word kraton, which comes from the word kratos, which means strong, force, strength, or might, manifested power, or dominion. It describes power in activity and effect. It's the, it's the word which is uh, sometimes called ruling power or dominion. It's the strength to do it. It's the strength to do it. Some people have strength for show, and some people have strength to do it. Hello? You know, when, when you watch, uh, I, I used to work with a guy who was a bodybuilder who competed. And uh, it was funny, but that's another story. But, uh, but I, I used to work with this guy. But you know, at these, at these events, it's all about balance and proportion and pumping up. It's not, you say, what do you do with those muscles? I show them to people. <laughs> but what are they useful for? They won me all these trophies. Are you there? Now, before you pick up stones, the bodybuilders in the crowd, the point is, I'm not saying that a bodybuilder can't do anything, but generally speaking, if you're dead serious about your bodybuilding, you're not also messing with stuff. You're trying to keep everything perfect, balanced, proportioned, exactly the way you want it to be. Now, if you've ever watched one of these world's strongest man competitions, none of those guys are winning any points for how beautiful they look. But they can drag a bus from here to there. That's power in action. That's strength to get the job done. That's dominion. Sometimes dominion has a big gut, but it gets the job done. Sometimes dominion's lumpy in some odd places, has a kind of a bruise or a scar or a thing or a bandage, but dominion gets it done. You want a cement ball this big picked up and put on top of that, you better call dominion, because this isn't doing that for you. Are you awake? And what makes this covenant better is not that it looks good, it's that it gets it done. It's better in the sense that it's got the power to do the job. It's a stronger covenant. 
And the reason it's a stronger covenant is because it's established or enacted on better promises. Stronger promises. Promises that get the job done. Promises that have the power to do what needs to be done. You're living in bondage to sin, out of control. I don't know why I do the things I do. I hate myself so much, so much of the time, except when I'm busy rationalizing and justifying myself and how I'm not as bad as other people. And here comes promises which are powerful enough to separate you from the authority of sin, from the tyranny of sin, to separate you from the guilt and the burden of sin, to separate you from the power of sin, to ransom you to wholeness. That's a pretty special promise. That, that's, that's, that's better than something dressed up and looking good. That's something which gets the job done. And these exceeding great and precious promises, what is it that, that Peter declares to us? Exceeding great and precious promises by which we're able to become partakers of the divine nature. We get to participate in the very nature of God by the exceeding great and precious promises that he makes. That'll wake you up. Now, what he goes into after that, I want to point, he says at verse 7, for if the first covenant had been faultless, then it should no place have sought for the second, and so on. What, what he's about to say is essentially this. If you thought the first covenant was about making you complete, in that regard, it couldn't have been because in the Old Testament, prophets testified that a day was coming when a new covenant would come, and there'd be no point for a new covenant if the old covenant it got that job done. So you say, but I thought God gave them that covenant. Why wouldn't it have been good? It was. It was good for what he designed it for. But if you thought that what it was designed for was to complete you, you're mistaken because it wasn't good for that because even the Old Testament testifies of that in that there's a day coming when another covenant will be. And there wouldn't be any other covenant if that covenant had completed it. This covenant had a purpose. So he goes into this lengthy argument in chapter 8 in the beginning of chapter 9, which concludes at verse 8 with the Holy Ghost thus signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while the first tabernacle was standing. The first tabernacle was a figure for the time then present. And in it, in that time then present, there were gifts and sacrifices made which could never complete the people making them. Now he goes on at verse 10 to say, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings. Meats meaning food. We're talking about the carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. He's saying all this stuff was outside of them. We're not dealing with the root issue. We're dealing with eating and drinking and washing and all of this stuff, which is not to say that it has no use, but it's an illustration. It's an analogy which is designed to show us something. It's supposed to teach us something. It's supposed to lead us somewhere. The time when things are going to change. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle made not with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Now, what a statement this is. Christ comes as a high priest of the things which are to come, the good things which are to come, of a greater and more perfect tabernacle. Greater, in a very literal sense, means huger. It's the comparative of mega. It means immenser. The tabernacle he represents, you wouldn't be able to build your camp around. The tabernacle he represents is one large enough for the saints of all the ages to be together rejoicing in. The tabernacle he represents is immenser, vastly immenser than anything you've ever seen. No temple, no tabernacle of, of man's making could possibly show us the vastness of the tabernacle Jesus represents. And it's more perfect, it's more complete. It is simultaneously 
a huger and more complete tabernacle that Jesus comes representing. It's not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, or the word building there more literally creation. It's not of this realm. It's not a thing made with hands or part of this creation. So the tabernacle he represents is other than the tabernacle of the earth. Then it says, neither by the blood of bulls and goats, or excuse me, by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Having one time ransomed us. Having one time ransomed us. He's entered in. So, Jesus is a high priest of a tabernacle which isn't of this creation. He doesn't use the blood of animals in this creation, but his blood. We're, we're recognizing this, this whole thing is just so vastly beyond and outside of the system. How could you even hope to... Have you ever seen one of these architects' renderings of what something's going to be? This is the new downtown made out of three sixteenths of inch styrofoam. Little trees standing there, people walking their dog over here. You look at this thing. When you've got the real thing, how attached are you to this silly little styrofoam illustration? Oh, I don't want to go live in that big building. I want to live here with this. Who would say such a thing? What kind of ridiculousness would that be? Well, I kind of like my trees about an inch and a half high. That works for me. This is nice. Never have to cut the lawn over here. No, I mean, you might save it as some type of memento, but the usefulness of it is over when the thing it illustrates comes. The only reason to make the silly thing is to show you what it's going to look like before it gets here. Once it's here, we can say, look at that. And you, oh, okay, I see, yes, five-story apartment building, lovely. This is a model to illustrate it. The tabernacle is a model to illustrate what is to come, but now that the what is to come is here, we don't have to love and worship and dwell upon the, the tabernacle, we can let go of it to receive this new covenant and what it represents. And you've perhaps noticed that we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper in a few minutes. And when we do, what we remind ourselves of and testify to is this new covenant in His body and His blood. Consider, having considered Jesus, let's consider this new covenant. And ask yourself, what does it mean that I've been called to an eternal inheritance through a better covenant, a stronger covenant, enacted on stronger promises? What is that about? How shall we then live? What does that mean about today and tomorrow and the rest of this week? What does that mean about my service to him who's called me, who's made me? What does that mean? What does this speak to me concerning? Is this making a little bit of sense to you? He says, verse 12 again, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. He's saying, listen, the Levitical system gave you the right to act as though you had clean flesh. It's the equivalent of washing your hands. But washing your hands doesn't deal with the invisible parts of you, does it? No matter how many times you wash your hands, you can still have a dirty mind, can't you? And if your conscience condemns you, 
You can't wash your hands enough to deal with that, can you? But where the blood of bulls and goats could deal with the flesh, the blood of Christ can deal with your conscience can reach into the deepest parts of you and say, you're new. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new and all things are of God. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God in him. That's better than a good religious system. That's better than I like the songs and the disciplines of this group. We're talking about actually touching your life instead of just your experience. How much more shall the blood of Christ, how much more? Not how shall not the blood of Christ equally as well, but how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And it is generally the case with everything related to God. He doesn't just talk about what you're delivered from. He talks about what you're delivered to. You know that in, in perhaps the ultimate illustration of that, Israel's coming out of Egypt was never viewed as a finished product by God. He didn't bring them out of Egypt to bring them out of Egypt. He brought them out of Egypt to bring them into Canaan, the land of promise, exceeding great and precious promises, the land where they lived in the covenant that he had made with them. He never intended for them to be out of Egypt to be wherever it is they felt like they wanted to be. They come out of Egypt with a destination in mind. And we're not just set free from, we're set free to. And he doesn't just purge our conscience from dead works, he purges our conscience from dead works that we might live to serve the living God. And you know, to the extent that I think serving the living God sounds like hard and unthankful, thankless work, to that extent, I'm thinking the wrong thoughts. Serve God? I don't know if I can get into that. That's what got me into what I've been into, thinking that way. And that's why it needs to go. The blood of Jesus can purge our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, because all of this is true, because the new covenant is a better covenant, a stronger covenant, enacted on stronger promises, because this covenant was prophesied even under the old covenant, because the entire whole Levitical system was nothing but an illustration of this covenant, because Jesus is the high priest of a huger and more complete tabernacle, and his blood is vastly more powerful and more efficient than the blood of the old covenant. Because he himself has offered himself so that we might be purged from dead works and alive unto God. For this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, the New Covenant. That by means of death, for the redemption of transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. This is the new covenant that he's made with us. This is what it's about. This is why he's done this thing. That gives us a precious calling, a calling to receive an eternal inheritance. Think how precious it is to be called of God. That he wooed and drew you you didn't get smart. 
You didn't figure this out. You didn't ponder many paths and choose the wisest one. You were drawn by the Spirit. You came as we all did, with lots of questions and a minimal understanding. But something in you knew that you needed to do this thing. And that something was the Holy Spirit of the living God calling you. Having received that calling, you know, so many people spend so much of their lives trying to find some acceptance, trying to find somebody to respect them or accept them or notice them or be interested in them. And here's God noticing you and interested in you and wanting to accept you, respecting you enough to give his only begotten son for you. And people blow right by that like, yeah, but I would still want people to like me. My life can't be complete if my neighbor doesn't respect me. When God has put himself out there in such a, a, a real way, how many of us spend any time in any given week feeling special because God has called us? But we are. And he's called us that we might receive an eternal inheritance. Is that good news? Amen. Let's take a moment and stand together, if you will. In the 10th chapter of the book of Romans, it says to us at the 9th verse, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now, sometimes we're not sure uh, what it means to be called of God. We're thinking, you know, if God was calling me, would the clouds be parting? Would I be hearing an audible voice? How would I know that God was calling me? Would there be two angels standing beside me here saying, you, yes, you, you're the one? How would I know that God is calling me? And the answer is very simply this. The Spirit of the living God is working in us. Just the fact that we're questioning this is a testimony that He's talking to us about it. The, the notion that you're asking yourself, but do I really believe? Well, if you didn't, you wouldn't be bothered with the thought. If you didn't believe at all, you wouldn't be questioning whether you believe or not. I've, I've had several conversations in the last few years with folks who talked to me about being in services in situations where they struggled with this. They, they're listening to an invitation similar to this one, and they're thinking, I don't know. They were looking for something bigger, more dramatic, more exciting, more convincing, more undeniable. And I'm saying, the question you're asking is all the evidence that you need that the Spirit is calling to you because if you were oblivious to this, you'd be oblivious to this. But I'm not sure if I really believe. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We have visited God's Word this morning and the Spirit of the living God is offering to us the opportunity to believe. Jesus Christ is the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. We don't produce complete faith and bring it and offer it to God. We take a step based on the faith He's offered us and grab hold of that weird thing He's offering us called believing and say, yes, Lord, I do believe, and step out. And as we step and say, I believe. I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. I believe that Jesus is alive today. I believe that Jesus is Lord. We're transformed. The promise of God is that we become new creations, born of His Spirit, with His divine nature imprinted upon us. I'm going to take a moment and pray, and I'm going to confess my faith in Jesus Christ, and I'm going to invite you to join me. Join me in, in celebrating, 
this great victory that you've received, or join me as you enter into this victory for the first time. But in either case, to join me. Dear God, I come to you today in the precious name of Jesus. And I thank you for hearing my cry. I do believe that Jesus Christ is risen. You've raised him from the dead. I believe he's alive today. And I confess with my mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you, Father, for this new life, for this new covenant, for this clean conscience. In Jesus' precious name, amen.